Good morning. Good morning. I like fruit. I think most kids like fruit too. Uh, sometimes when I'm really hungry, I put raisins in my oatmeal, and some people are going to go, Ugh. my granddaughter won't eat my oatmeal because it has raisins in it. I like it that way. I think raisins make everything better because they're fruity, they're sweet, they're yummy, and they add to it much better than chocolate chips, in my humble opinion. Fruit. It does a body good. Oh, I'm hearing lots of comments up here. We are fortunate to live in a part of the world where we have terrific access to fresh fruit. Go to any grocery store, there will be a beautiful, colorful display of different fruits, the way that they wash and array them, colors and shapes, and sometimes it's even hard to pick out what to buy because you have so many options. I remember a time when I couldn't afford to buy fruit, and so I'm very thankful that today I can do that. But it is possible to be disappointed by fruit. Have you ever picked up a beautiful apple and took a big bite out of it and the inside was mushy and brown? Or you found part of a bug? Or <laughs> That heaven calling? Yeah. Or picked up a beautiful peach and it's just gorgeous. And then on the underside, your fingers just kind of mush into it. You go, oh. Or picked up an orange while you're out on your walk and when you get home, you're anticipating eating this orange and you peel it and you take a section and, and it's, it's sour or woody and you realize you've gotten a mock orange or ornamental orange. Disappointment. We have expectations, even about our fruit. We have standards. But what is fruit really all about? What is it for? It's really only about the seeds replicating itself, making more fruits so they can have more plants. So it is only a byproduct of the fruitiness that it's tasty, that it's yummy, that it's sweet, that we like it. But in order for fruit to do its job, it must be tended. And there's a message here for us, isn't there? Fruitfulness. I mentioned just a little bit earlier how much I enjoy raisins and things. For me, they just make everything better. I love them. However, raisins don't just happen. They're not expensive, and you can find them in almost any store. But uh, there was a time in the past when we tried to grow them. My mother planted grapevines. I know, Mary's laughing. Yeah, it's not easy. Uh, mother planted grapevines on the patio because they make beautiful shade. They're pretty leaves. They're beautiful. The tendrils, um, they're, they're lovely vines to look at. And so they were pretty plants. And we thought, OK, we'll get grapes too. Bonus. Well, on the rare occasion that grapes did actually grow on the vines, they were never actually edible. The times we got them, they were kind of like tiny, bright green ball bearings, and they weren't tasty. First of all, ball bearings are not easy to chew, and they were very tart. Anyway, we, we didn't actually get grapes. So there must be more to it than just planting vines and harvesting in a few months. Well, what was the problem? Well, we did not understand that grapevines need tending. There's a skill required in order to grow grapes. Something had to be done to the vines, and we didn't have the knowledge or the skill. Therefore, no grapes. And the real purpose of grapes, as I mentioned earlier, is the seeds. Well, we don't like grapes with seeds in them, do we? I purposefully buy the seedless grapes. How many of you like the grapes with seeds in them? Raise your hand. That's what I thought. Oh, seriously? <laughs> <laughs> all right, we are. always knew Matt was odd. Anyway, um, so if you can't grow grapes, then you don't get the seeds, right? And you don't get more fruit. Because that's the whole purpose of grapes, to grape more fruit, more grapes. So we're going to be talking about that to get, you probably figured that already, right? 
From John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8, please rise to honor the reading of God's word. And I will be reading from the Passion Translation, so it will look a little bit different than your version, probably. Jesus said, I am a true sprouting vine, and the farmer who tends the vine is my father. He cares for the branches connected to me by lifting and propping up the fruitless branches and pruning every fruitful branch to yield a greater harvest. The words I have spoken over you have already cleansed you. So you must remain in life union with me, for I remain in life union with you. For as a branch severed from the vine will not bear fruit, so your life will be fruitless unless you live your life intimately joined to mine. I am the sprouting vine and you are my branches. As you live in union with me as your source, fruitfulness will stream from within you. But when you live separated from me, you are powerless. If a person is separated from me, he is discarded. Such branches are gathered up and thrown into the fire to be burned. But if you live in life union with me, and if my words live powerfully within you, then you can ask whatever you desire and it will be done. When your lives bear abundant fruit, you demonstrate that you are my mature disciples who glorify my Father. This is the word of God for the people of God, and all God's people said, Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Pruning. Jesus does not hesitate to lay things out just as we need to hear them. Unfortunately, those of us who are not gardeners might not fully understand this passage. We might miss some of the significance. Immediately in verse 1, if you have your copy of God's Word, I heartily recommend this. I mention it frequently. If you have a copy of it, have it open. That way you can follow along and make notes, visible notes. It helps you remember things. We talked about that in Sunday school earlier this morning how we remember. We don't remember very well. So, in verse 1 of chapter 15 of John, Jesus tells us that there is a master gardener. God is tending this garden on earth. I'm glad he's in charge. And we need tending. We read that throughout this passage. We are in danger if we are not being tended. In verse 2, Jesus says, we need propping up. How many of you have felt like you needed propping up in the recent past? Me too. Me too. This past week especially has been very difficult. And I've needed a lot of propping up. I haven't say that I, I can't say that I have um, sought out to be pruned. But I really needed to be propped up and tended to. So the branches, this is the scary part, the branches that are already bearing fruit, what does Jesus say about that? Test. The branches that are already bearing fruit are going to be pruned. So what's that all about? Aren't they the good ones? Okay. Heads up. This is not a good versus bad passage, okay? It's a good and good and getting better passage. So the branches that are already producing fruit are going to be pruned. Pruning is painful. I'm not talking about the plant now. I'm talking about us, and so is Jesus. It's scary to think about. What is God going to cut out or cut off? What is God going to expose in my life that I don't want to think about or want anybody else to know about? What might I have to live without when I'm being pruned? And there will be no fruit without Jesus. He says that very clearly. No fruit if you're not connected to me. We like to think that we're in charge. I have a granddaughter who leads the pack. She's only seven. She's actually sort of near the bottom of the lineup of all the grandkids, but she believes that she's in charge. We say she's large and in charge. We, we like to think that, don't we? That we're the master of our own fates, the captains of our soul. Lots of, there are lots of songs and poems about that, right? 
Frank Sinatra bet way back when, it's still sung occasionally, I did it my way. Well, where is he now? I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> when I was in high school, there was a poem called, I mean, it's still there, but I read it for the first time in high school, a poem called Invictus that was written um, decades ago, and it's been very popular because it expresses how we like to think about things. The last stanza of that poem says, it matters not how straight the gate, and straight is this term means very narrow, it matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. And lots of people really relate to that poem because we it's inspirational it's it sounds exciting it sounds powerful and potent and yet it's scoffing at jesus it says it doesn't matter how many things i've done wrong I, i'm in charge here right it's captivating it feels like it's putting us in charge of our puny branch but no branch can survive without being intimately connected with the true life-giving vine. We are not the masters of our fate, no matter how much we like to think we are. We cannot bring ourselves to life. How many of you are in charge of that? Breathing life into something else or yourself. I mean, it's kind of laughable, isn't it? And yet... That's what Jesus is telling us in this passage right now. We can't do it on our own. Vines are thrown into the fire to burn up because they aren't good for anything else. Another passage in the New Testament, which we're not going to read, uh, we learn that the vines aren't even good for giving warmth. So they're not even, they don't have any purpose at all, the grapevines. In my backyard, I have cat's claw vines, and I love them because when I look at my window, I see all this greenery, you know, in the middle of the desert, and it kind of makes me happy, and it looks a little bit cooler because it's green, even when it's really hot in July and August, and it does cool the backyard down just a little bit, but occasionally I'll look out there and I'll see there's these, these yellowish brown things sticking out, and I realize, oh, somebody broke off a branch, it's usually the dog chasing his ball, and I have to go out there and pull it out of the cat's claw and throw it away because, you know what, it's not going to turn green again. I can stick it in the ground and water it all I want, nothing's happening. It's just ugly, it's sticking out, it's in the way, if I don't pull it out, it's just going to stay there. So, what is the point of having the, the dead stuff hanging around? God prunes the dead stuff and he prunes the fruit. What is it like to be pruned? What types of pruning, I'm not asking you to say this out loud. It might be too personal. What types of pruning has God performed on you? Has he? Are you fruitful enough to warrant being pruned? I can tell you from personal experience that pruning hurts. I don't like it. I don't like hearing God tell me through other people or through dramatic circumstances translate getting hit in the face with a bus sometimes. Uh, it's traumatic. I don't like it. To have something you rely on taken away, something you think you need, something you like, something you want, something you're used to and have to learn how to do without it, it feels like loss. It is a form of loss. All change is loss. But if we are intimately connected to the source of life, the true vine, we will remain healthy and become healthier. But in this passage about problems and pruning, there's also promise. And this is where we can really take hold. There's the promise of life. This message is being given, is being preached by Jesus to a bunch of people who have already heard and responded to his message of hope and life. They have recognized that they need more than what their lives held before. 
These people got it. They're there. They're on board. They've recognized this. And before meeting Jesus, they didn't have it, and now they do. Before hearing about the abundant life, no longer will God's people be divided into us versus them. That's what Jesus is also telling us. The Jews and the Gentiles, the haves and the have-nots. We are now one people, grafted onto the one true vine. In verse 1, Jesus tells them this way that they have chosen, this way that they have chosen. The only way is to have real life. This is it. The only way. If you're not grafted to the true vine, you are not living. And once again, he uses a common earthy metaphor. Vines, grapevines, plants. That these people would have understood. Like last week, we talked about sheep. I am the sheep is one of the seven I am statements in John. And this is another one. I am the true vine. Why did he say it so many different ways? So we could understand it. Because we're not very good at that. He's talking about vines and branches. You cut off a branch, what happens? It dies. Life-giving sap and charcoal fires where the dead branches are thrown. In verse 2, the Greek phrase that we read can also be translated, instead of cropping up, he takes up to himself every fruitless branch. Think about that. Takes up to himself. How intimate does that sound? Have you ever wanted to be gathered to God's bosom and hugged and comforted? I have. I told you this week I hated propping up. That's what this verse is. God does not remove these branches, but he takes them to himself as the wise and loving farmer. He lifts them up and props them up away from the ground so they can get air around the branches so the bugs cannot infest and destroy them. In the context, Christ's endless love for his disciples on the last night that he had on earth seems to emphasize God's love even for those who fail and disappoint him. What did God do with Peter who denied him blatantly, out loud, repeatedly on that last night? What did Jesus do with Peter? He propped him up. He said, you've got this because I am with you. And he used Peter to start a new theme. Does that not give you hope? Amen. It gives me hope. Have you ever felt less than? I've asked you that before. Fruitless? I know I have. But this promise of lifting up and propping up those of us who are not bearing any fruit right now is a merciful, life-giving promise. There will be barren times in our lives when we feel like we're not being useful to God, like nothing's going on, and we're not getting it right. Just taking up space. But Jesus promises us in verse 3 that his message, listen to this carefully, Jesus says, my words, this message that Jesus gave us, that he wooed us with and called us, has made us clean. has made us acceptable to God, has made us part of the vine. And in verse 4, we read a command and an exhortation, but it's also a wonderful <laughs> promise. Verse 4, Jesus will remain in us. He will never leave us. He is part of us. He is intimate and loving and caregiving and necessary. It's a relationship. So, do not resist the pruning. <coughs> God knows how and what must be done in order to make us fruitful. Do not resist that good, hard work that God is doing. God, the master gardener, knows what to cut off, when to cut it off, how far to go, how to prop us up. 
And remember that whatever's being pruned from your life might be painful. But if you want hope, if you want life, the pruning is necessary. And I'm looking at people out here that have been pruned drastically in the past seasons. And you know what I'm talking about. It hurts. It's horrible. It's painful. And yet, what God brings out of the pruning, out of the difficulties, can be so much more precious, so much more fruitful. And so, don't be afraid. Well, it's normal to be afraid. But allow God to do the pruning. And the bottom line is verse 8, the last verse that we read. This, all of this that I've just been talking about, this pruning, this propping up, this fruitfulness, all of this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. What is he saying? Without fruit, it's not evident that we belong to God. Fruit is a part of it. Or the translation we read earlier from the Passion Translation. When your lives bear abundant fruit, you demonstrate that you are my mature disciples who glorify my Father. As much as it is all about us, it's not all about us. It's all about God. If we are going to call ourselves Christians, call ourselves believers, then our lives must demonstrate that. We must be fruitful. Not fruity, fruitful. In order to be fruitful, we must be connected to God intimately and powerfully. And we must gratefully, graciously allow God to prune us when and where God says we need it or we don't get grapes. Embrace the pruning. <laughs> Sorrow. 